I did a survey several years ago. I'd like to do it again because things have changed a lot. But even several years ago, I uh, created a one-page, 12-question questionnaire and handed it with an interview to each one of 100 converts over a period of three years. And thankfully now I have, uh, in three years, a lot more than 100. But those 100 I met in conferences and different uh, venues around the country. And I asked questions. Some of these questions about themselves, what religious group they came from, their level of devotion, were they secular, moderate, or fanatic? Did they pray? Did they fast? Some of those sort of survey questions. But the most significant question was the last question, number 12. How did you know Jesus Christ? What were the means, what were the means or the one mean that drew you, attracted you to Christ? And I had multiple questions and then left room for them to add whatever they want. Some of these questions were, has someone handed me scripture, a gospel or a Bible. Uh, a Christian met me on campus. Questions like that. When I tabulated the results, I was amazed. So I'll give you two of those statistics that are very significant. 60% said they had seen dreams and visions of Jesus. Are you surprised? No. Because you've heard that. 60% did surprise me. And I believe today it's even more. If there is a change, it's higher. Because there's hardly one Muslim I talk to who had not seen dreams and visions of Jesus. Let's ask those who are with us here. Sarah, did you have dreams? No, she's one, out. <laughs> Sarah, yes. Adil, no. So now we have a third of the three <laughs> who's had dreams. And I meet a lot of them who tell me amazing dreams, how Jesus appeared to them. And some of them, in broad daylight, they see a man, white robe, with uh, uh, a face that is bright like the sun coming to them and speaking to them. And they know it's not a human being. They know it's Jesus somehow. Some of them don't know. One guy in Denver from Sudan, I met him at a church, and he had not become a Christian, nor was he interested. He said, I'm a Muslim. So I took him to lunch to talk to him and talk to him about how there are dreams and visions and so on. Have you had a dream, I asked. And this is one of the things in your notes here to ask every Muslim you meet. It's OK if they didn't have a dream. But if they did, then you know God has been ahead of you there, loosening the ground and softening the heart. This fellow had a dream but did not know it's a Jesus dream. He said, I had a dream, but I, I, I didn't know it was Jesus. So tell me the dream. He said, I was standing at the side of a lake. And on the other side, there was a man dressed in white, and his face was bright. And he waved to me to come to him. And I said, I can't, I can't swim. And he said, walk on the water. So he started walking on the water. And then uh, when he got a bit deeper, started drowning. And that man in white came to him and rescued him, took him to the shore. I had uh, a believer with me, Sahar. Some of you met her. You met her last year here. She was an intern last year here. She told him, hey, your dream is in the Bible. And she opened to the story of Peter walking on water. And that made a huge difference in his life. 
Three weeks later, his host family led him to Christ. And now he's a member of that church for the last year and a half or so. The second item of import to this uh, survey, 85% said it's the love of a Christian. It's the love of Christians. And because it was, there's a place for them to write, I have tabulated the different things they said. Some of them said, someone approached me on the campus. Someone met me in a grocery store. Someone saw me on the street. And they were kind to me, helped me. Someone taught me English. Someone took me to open a bank account. Acts of kindness by Christians communicated the love of Christ. So, watch out. If 85% have come to Christ through a relationship of love and kindness and help and so on, would you consider that a most successful strategy or not? So that's what we need to do. We need to engage people in love and to reach out to them in practical love. Not only love them into the kingdom, but love them as human beings and not treat them as projects. My church gave me money to reach out to you, therefore I'm obligated kind of attitude. No, it's because you really, really love them. Do you love Muslims? I know people who hate Muslims, and they end up, as Andre said, with their anger and frustration doing polemics. Now, polemics can be done in a loving way, but it can also be done in a revengeful way. You bad people, look at your prophet. He's terrible. He's a pedophile, he's a murderer, he's a thief, and all that stuff. That does not go very far, even if it may be true. So love has been a major factor in drawing people to Christ. Now I want to share with you some principles. They're in your notes. I'm going to make this larger so you can see it. Hey, that's not what I mean. Left corner. I know, I just want to click here somewhere. What is this? Okay, it's hidden. It's here. Uh, zoom, exit full screen. Zoom in. I can zoom more. Here it is, here it is. 200, how about 300? Can you read it? 300, it's in your book, but I want to follow it. Just, you can read it from your book too. Winning the hearts and souls. There are some principles for this. This was an independent uh, seminar I did without all the other things you heard. So I've included some of the principles that I've already shared with you, but we'll do it here in summary. Spiritual preparation, fasting and prayer before you meet Muslims, before you reach out to them. Many are called, few are chosen. Don't be discouraged when many reject you, because not all people you witness to, and it's not a failure if people don't come to Christ. That's why when I asked the guy in Afghanistan, did you lead anyone to Christ? He said, no, I was still okay until he said, I've never witnessed to someone in seven years. So if you're witnessing and they are rejecting, he already told us they will reject you like they rejected me. Many are called, few are chosen. There's one practical lesson from this. When I, uh, when I was in uh, Austin, Texas, because Barbara is here, looking at the crowds, the last year, I don't think you were there. Last year, in yeah. you were there. There were three 
women veiled sitting next to each other. And there was a man from Turkey sitting here. The other woman I did not know for where they were from. And he was raising his hand arguing with me. And they were looking, every time I said something, they'd go like this. They were whispering to each other. I knew they were positive. So when I have crowds in front of me, I'm looking for those on the edge of their seats. So at the end of my talk, I knew from experience that this guy sitting where Sandy is now, first row, arguing with me, he's going to consume my time and he's going to take me away from those three and others who were more open and looked. I don't know their hearts, but I could tell some kind of a body language. So he, I came down through the aisle, he wanted to talk to me. I said, sorry, I have people I need to see. I left him behind. He ended up arguing with another guy. I don't know what happened to that. <laughs> and then I went, because I had a team where there were people from the churches that sponsored the event and InterVarsity navigators and bridges, uh, Campus Crusade groups and so on. So I went straight to those three women. Yeah, of course you were there, Barbara. Uh, because you're in the story, whenever I tell the story. So I talked to these three women. They said, can we see you privately? So we walked out, went to the side, out behind a wall. I thought they're going to kill me. But I said, it's fine, I'm ready to die. Christ. Anyway, it's not true. They were very <laughs> young, gentle, beautiful, three women, veiled, same way, almost like twins. And they said, everything you said made sense to us. We want to know more. I said, no problem. Let's call somebody to help you because I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, actually, the day after tomorrow to go back to Boulder. So I called, uh, what's her name? She works with Bridges. Ho Hoida? Uh, Holida. 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 I said, Holida, come and talk with them. So she took it over and I went to talk to other people. It was an Iranian guy and others. Spent there till about 10 o'clock at night. And then Barbara was going to take me, drive me to where I was staying at Mark Stefan's house. And while we were going to the car, we saw Holida with the three women on the road. I don't know if you remember that. I don't remember that. And so we hollered to them and said good night. And then we went away. The next day, Friday, I, was, I had announced that I'll be on the campus all day from 9 o'clock till 4 p.m. answering your questions if you want to come. So a number of them came all throughout the day, and Holida showed up. And Holida is a convert from Kazakhstan who has been trained. She's been here several times in this building. And uh, she told me, you know those girls? I was up with them till 3 AM, sharing the gospel with them. And they had so many questions. We were exhausted by 3 AM. And they slept on my couch and on the floor because they, did not, they didn't have the energy to go back to their apartment. They slept there. And the next morning, they had breakfast together. And they talked some more. And she let them go. This is the kind of people you need to waste your time on. Waste. Don't waste your time on the Turkish guy who all wants to show you how knowledgeable he is. And he's going to fight with you and argue with you to no avail. So I have learned to discern through the Spirit of God. And that's, a, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit that you can ask for. The Lord give you discernment. We pray for that. Pray for wisdom. Jesus, uh, James said, if you lack wisdom, ask. God will give it to you. So we, uh, we need to learn from that. Many are called, but a few are chosen. One here, one here, one there. And that's what we need to spend time on. So if you go into a city, to a town and so on, maybe your neighbors will be the right people, but maybe they're not. So don't be stuck on your neighbors. Be stuck on the people that seem to be open and have questions and they want to know more. God loves his children, his treasured possessions. Do not be afraid. 
the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but powerful to those being saved. That's 1 Corinthians 1 from 17 to 22. I would love to, ex to expose that uh, passage to you to show you that uh, uh, Paul is not a contextualist because he said the Jews want something, the Greeks want something else. The Jews want signs, the Greeks want wisdom, but we don't give them signs and wisdom, we give them Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Hey, you Paul, you know that your message is a stumbling block and you still preach it? Why don't you water it down so that people will accept you? Well, at least in the beginning and later on maybe you'll tell them the truth. It doesn't work that way. If they're going to be stumbled by it, let them be stumbled now. Not two years, three years down the road. Right now, if they know you're a Christian, they still want to associate with you, great. If you can witness to them and they still want to associate with you, great. But if they want to leave you, you go to someone else. You're with me? It sounds harsh, but it isn't. It's harsh to those who are perishing, but it's compassion towards those who are being saved. Paul said uh, he did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, but the power of the Spirit. Barbara touched on this topic. How will they believe if no one tells them? Yesterday I was talking to one of our wonderful students here who sits right there wearing blue. She has green glasses. <laughs> and she told me, and she agrees, it's not like uh, opposed to me, about Francis Assisi. You know him? You know what he said? Everybody knows this. Almost everybody. Let's see how many of you know it. Preach the gospel always, all the time, and if necessary, use words. If necessary, use words. Is this an inspired word? Is this from revelation from the Holy Spirit? That's a human being, he has an opinion, and if you read the context of what he wrote, you'll probably agree with him that many times we just preach down the throats of people, but we're not living the Christian life, and he was trying to say, we need a Christian lifestyle that supports our words. So live, live your Christian life. But we can take this too far, as many have, and believe it or not, some of you may believe it, most of you may not. There is a style of witness called silent witness. Have you heard of that? Silent witness? Silent witness? All right, I'm called, summoned, subpoenaed to the court, and I sit there and I plead silence. The lawyers ask me questions. What kind of witness is that? If you're a criminal, you're allowed to remain silent. Everything you say can be held against you. But if you're a witness, you will be held in contempt of court. There is no silent witness. No. We need words because the witness means to tell what you saw. And the reason it has the meaning martyrdom is that always in the beginning of the church, those who were bold were martyred. That's why the word became martyr. And so they see someone die and they say he's a martyr, it means he is a witness. He witnessed and therefore he was killed. That's how the two words were associated. Thankfully, today, most of us will never be killed. If I know I'm going to have cancer tomorrow, I wish somebody would kill me today. <laughs> I don't want cancer. <laughs> but I don't know that, so I'm not allowed to kill myself. But I'm not that miserable that I want to kill myself. But the point of it is, it's better to die in battle preaching the gospel than to die from any other means, natural or unnatural. And uh, may God give us the conviction in our hearts that we've already died to self. 
We've already given our lives to Him. And we shouldn't hold on to anything, not even my own life. And those who hold on to life, Jesus said, they'll lose it. But those who give it away, they will gain it, not only he there, but also here. That's what Jesus taught us. So how will they believe if they haven't heard? We need to tell them. Don't go to a country and spend five days without witnessing to somebody. Maybe four days is okay. But five days and five years, oh, I can't even believe it. It happens only because I know it happens. I've met people who never witness. One problem, I want to challenge you with that, is that before we leave the, for the mission field, we had never led someone to Christ. So if you've never led someone to Christ, and then you respond to a need to go to India, and you raise the funds for that, and you go to India, don't expect to be more fruitful in India than you were in your backyard. And the way I normally say it is I normally look, here's a bulb, light bulb doesn't work. Maybe because it's not switched. But if you switch it and it still doesn't work, that means it's burned, right? If, the, if this light bulb is burned, don't send it to India. <laughs> it, won't, it won't work there either. Otherwise, I'll be a millionaire collecting all the dead bulbs in America and shipping them to India and selling them for a penny each and I'll make good money. No. If you're not salt and light wherever you are, you're not salt and light. And you will never be effective anywhere you go. So don't go to the mission field without preparation other than the spiritual preparation. Prepare yourself by witnessing to people. I had a guy come to me, want my advice about what will he do when he goes to Japan and he wants to, he has a heart to go work in Japan as a missionary. I said, I'll tell you what, we have a lot of Japanese people on campus here. You come on Friday night, you'll meet them and you'll begin to witness to them. You'll make some mistakes, maybe, and you'll learn and I can help you coach it. Oh, I don't have time. You have time to go to Japan, but you don't have time to witness the Japanese here. That means you're considering missions as tourism. I wrote an article on biblical missiology, if you want to check it out. Short-term missions are glorified tourism. And there are those who have long-term tourism, where they move from America, live in another country, but they're on vacation all the time, literally. Like their life is just to take care of their children, their wives, go shopping, do things, and occasionally they go to a coffee shop to talk to a few people. I have seen these in my own eyes. That's not a missionary. Just because you went to, another, to a mission field, you're not a missionary. You're a missionary if you're preaching the gospel and witnessing. How will they hear without a witness? ACMI is a Christian association of ministries to internationals. We had a conference in Wheaton, Illinois, end of May this year. All the directors of ministries got together. I was one of them. In a room, there were about 20 of us. Michelle, uh, Don's wife, was there with me. And uh, we started talking. The coordinator of the conference said, tell us about your ministry. We went around everybody. We were together two hours or two and a half hours. Everybody shared something. At the end, he said, uh, does anybody have something to say? We have about 15 more minutes that we haven't touched on. I said, yes. I said, I want you to remember what you shared with us in the last two hours. I did not hear any one of you say that you're leading people to Christ. I've heard you say that you're having potluck dinners, you're having cultural events,
teaching English as a second language, helping people with the uh, refugee resettlement, picking up people from airports, and doing all kinds of things. What happened to the gospel? Did we forget who we are? Did we forget our calling? And why did we start an international student ministry? How are we better than the campus that has an office for international affairs? And they take care of these things for their students. And they don't mention Jesus. They don't pray before they eat the meal. Is this a difference that we pray before we eat and they don't? You know what I'm talking about now? Please don't be one of those people. You didn't come here to be entertained. And I'm not going to tickle your ears. I'm going to prick your heart. If you have a heart for missions, if you have a heart of compassion toward the lost, open your mouth and speak. And God will give you the words. Just begin. Of course, you'll do better than that after you leave from here. Next point, assume they are open until they prove they are closed. There's a lot of people who come to missions with a defeatist mentality that nothing has been happening here. Once I was speaking at a conference in London to about 300 people who came together uh, to discuss strategies to enter Libya. I had attended that conference a number of years. It was all talk, 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 talk. So I stopped going. And then all of a sudden, I got an email, would you come and speak to this group? Said, yeah, I want to go speak to this group. I'm tired of listening to talk. So the man who spoke in front, before me, I only had one hour to speak. The one before me, it was a three-day conference, he said, when I went to Libya, I looked around and I saw, I didn't see the harvest. I didn't see ripe harvest. All I saw is concrete. And you dig and you find more concrete underneath and more concrete below. That's what he saw in Libya. So I came up right after him. I said, brother, forgive me, but I don't see that to be biblical. Jesus said, open your eyes and you'll see the harvest is ripe. If you expect nothing, you will get nothing. But if you go with a heart determined, no matter what happens, even if you get killed, that you're going to share, declare the goodness of God and the good news of the gospel, you're going to get results. Wherever the gospel is preached, people come to know him. That's been my experience. In 21 years of working in Kosovo, only one time that I visited Kosovo and did not lead anyone to Christ. And I did not even realize it until once I was speaking, says every time I go to Kosovo, there are people being saved. One, two, three, four, sometimes 10, 15, and more. And then I remembered, last time I was there, I don't remember leading anybody to Christ. So I had reflection on this later, and I realized on this trip I did not preach the gospel. So there's the formula. Preach the gospel, there'll be results. How will they believe if they haven't heard? But that means if they hear, they will believe. Not all of them, but that's covered already. Many are called, few are chosen. And I did not save everybody I talked to, but out of five, six hundred people in a five-day evangelistic campaign we did in Kosovo, we had by the end of the week 15 people come to Christ, added to the church. Not too tacky. No. Not too bad. 15 out of five, 600, not bad. And the others, five and 600, may not have accepted Christ now, but over time, they do. 
because they hurt, they have to process, maybe they didn't have courage. One of them actually, number 15, I had prayed for her for two and a half hours that morning. She was the wife of one who accepted Christ two months before, and he pleaded with me to pray for his wife. His name is Drani, her name is Arta, I'm still in touch with him. And Drani was passionate to have his wife come to Christ. They're both Muslim, and she began to persecute him because his life changed to the better, and she didn't like it. He says, I used to shout at her, hit her, be violent with her, and she was okay because I was a Muslim. Now that I don't, I don't lie to her anymore, I don't shout at her, I treat her kindly, she started being strong and powerful over me. And please pray for my wife. So we had about 20 people praying for her for about 15 minutes at one time when he shared with us. And then I spent, Monday she didn't come, Tuesday she didn't come, Wednesday she didn't come. Sunday before that, it was five days. I remember it was either Thursday or Friday. I can't remember the details now. The last day of the evangelistic campaign of five days. She had not come. So that morning I woke up early, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I ask for Arta. I prayed for other things as well, read the scripture, but during my time of devotions, I prayed for Arta with all of my heart. I said, Lord, we want her soul. And he told me, if I could have my wife, I want to serve the Lord. So I preached, asked people to come forward. People came forward. For five days, I had not asked them to come forward. That was the last day. Fifteen people showed up. Fourteen. And then I was depressed. I got mad at God. I was sad. I did not want to talk to anybody. I wish there was a door in the back that I could run out because I knew it was going to pain Adrani's heart that his wife did not come to Christ. And she had not attended any day except that day. And he dragged her, said, this is the last day. I want you to come. So she dragged her feet with her nine-year-old son. And they sat together, sort of third row. And they were looking at me all the time. She looked glazed like crystal. I could not tell how she's feeling, how she's thinking. Positive, negative, I couldn't tell. But my eyes were on her. And I would speak to her and then look at others and come back and look at her. Everybody started leaving. I greeted people. And Bibles were being flown out of the table like mad. We didn't have any left. Boxes under the table were empty and so on. It was amazing. It was in a rented theater, not a church. There was not a church big enough to have so many people. Then she comes to me at the end. She says, I want you to be the first one to know that I accepted Christ today. I said, why didn't you come forward with the others? She says, because I don't want anyone to know first except you first. Then I'm going to tell. They proceeded to start a church. And he became a pastor of the church after some training two years later. And they're still faithful to the Lord with their children. They now have three. Brothers and sisters, preach the gospel. Assume that they're open until you're proven wrong. And if you're proven wrong, walk away. Follow the example of Jesus. Now let's get to the factors of success. One, two, three, four, five. Five factors that I have identified that give results. Are you ready for them? Are you tired of my voice? No. I'm tired of my voice. I hear it all the time. <laughs> Linda, are you tired of my voice? No, no she says no. <laughs> Friends, I am very saddened when I see workers, Christian workers, who work with someone they lead him to Christ, and they don't want him to meet any other Christians. You know what I'm talking about, Mike? 
unfortunately. There was a guy whom you know who invited me to speak to his group in his home. There were 12 people. And he liked my teaching very much. And after leaving Tunis, came to the States, and he would Skype with me and tell me, come and talk to my group. And I would lead them through Skype, through worship, prayer, reading scripture, and teaching. He's an American, he had good knowledge of Arabic, but not good enough. So he liked my teaching, and he asked me to do that. The group grew from 12 to 22 one time, and then later on grew to 58, according to him. They weren't all meeting at the same time. That first meeting with the 12, I asked each one of them about their testimony. I was with them three hours, one afternoon. It was a Wednesday or Thursday, I don't remember. And on Friday, I was going to speak at the Charles de Gaulle Church. So I announced, I said, hey, I'd like you to come and hear me speak in the church. What church? They didn't even know there was a church. And then the guy told me in English, he says, I don't want them to know about this place. And he was mad at me <laughs> for telling them. So out of the 12, four people actually showed up because I had already told them where it is. So I was there eating a sandwich before the church, right, like a building next to it. And they came in to buy some sandwiches, four of them together. Oh, you came. Welcome, great. So he and uh, the four of them and I went into the church, and they looked around. They found 40 to 60. I don't remember how many exactly. Church wasn't completely full, but larger than this group. We did not know there were so many Christians here. We thought we were the only ones. Fast forward, this brother was there eight years. Then he decided he's had enough of missions. I don't want to judge him for that, but he felt called to go to North Carolina or someplace here, start an American church, and he informed me about that. One day I Skyped with him and says, tell me about your church. Who did you leave it to? He says, I don't know where they are. They're all gone. I don't have anyone left. Let's not do this to them. Here's factor number one. They need contact with Christians. One Muslim needs to meet many Christians. A young man needs to meet young men. But he also needs to meet young women, or else how is he going to get married? <laughs> he needs to meet families. He needs to meet people like me, white-haired. He needs to meet little children. He needs to meet doctors. He needs to meet garbage collectors. He needs to meet all kinds of Christians to get a picture of the community, the body of Christ. Don't hog them to yourself and keep them, protect them from other Christians. You can process with them the problems in the local church or the problems with other Christians, and that will become part of their growth and maturity. One big question you're going to be asked and you're going to be facing. When I have a group of believers, do I meet with them alone or do I connect them with the local church? What do you think I want you to do? And why? Because there's a lot of theories where we, the local church, let's give up on them. They have wrong leadership style. They have wrong this and wrong that. Lots of wrong things with them. Find me one perfect church in America. As they say, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because it won't be perfect after you do. One problem with this few people meeting together with you only is that you may not be there long. You may be gone. That's what happened with this brother. And then they got scattered. 
the sheep got scattered. They don't have someone else to be involved in their lives. That's one. Second, they're all new believers. They don't see a model of mature believers. They need mature believers to say, well, I want to be like this. They need to see how a man treats his wife. A Christian man treats his wife, not his father treating his mother. I was in Morocco once walking to my apartment where I was staying. 11 o'clock, it was raining, and I heard groaning. It was dark, so I came towards the groaning very gingerly. I didn't know what to expect. And I found a guy beating his wife in a dark area, in a shopping area that's deserted, it's closed. That's 11 o'clock. I said, what am I going to do? Maybe he's armed. I don't know what to do. So I stood behind a pillar watching, and I was able to see a little bit. Beating her, punching her, and she's oh, oh, crying like that, shouting. So I shouted and screamed at him, stop! And he said, who are you? And so that gave me boldness to come, came to him. I said, why are you doing this? She's my wife, I can do what I want. I said, your wife serves you. Why are you abusing her like this? I don't know what was going on, but I tried to separate them, and I stood between them. And she hung on to me, poor girl, put her head on my back like this, and crouched up like this, trying to protect herself from his punctures. I said, Lord God, send me somebody who could help us. I don't know what to do. I looked, and there was a guard walking with a yellow outfit. You could see, like, because at night he doesn't want to be hit over. As a, as a guard, like they, they guard the shops, they guard the area, and they walk around all night. So I shouted at the guard, hey, come over, come over. He said, what's wrong? He said, this man is beating his wife. He said, is she his wife? I said, yeah. He said, that's okay. <laughs> and he walked away. That was really sad. They need to see how Christians treat women, men, women, interactions, so on. So you got the point. Don't just keep them to yourself. Introduce them to other believers. You can still be their mentor. And if they like someone else more than you, let them go. We are not winning souls to ourselves. We are winning souls to Jesus. And Jesus has lots of servants. And if I am not doing well with you, let someone else do better. Maybe I'm too judgmental, or I'm this or that. Let them meet other people. Sarah, don't leave me, OK? This is not for you, that's for them. <laughs> Some people say, you know, you, they call me Baba, like Maddie calls me Baba. She met uh, Bill. She said, started calling him Baba. She said, is it OK if I call him Baba? I said, yeah, you can have 100 Babas. <laughs> That's all right. God uses us all. It takes a village to grow one person. I call you You don't call me Baba anymore? You re I, so you resigned, she resigned, okay. So you get the point. We need more Christians, and the more they see Christians, the more they understand Christianity. The more they understand the message of the cross. You teach me something, you teach me something else, you teach me something else, you teach me something else, and don't give them away. I'm not saying get rid of them and give them away to others. I'm saying introduce them to others and let there be a community of believers. Second factor, the more contact with Christians, number one, the more likely they become Christians. Second, literature, videos, Bibles. I say here, give him or her choices. And the reason I say that is that sometimes we're stuck on an idea 
that if you are dealing with uh, an Arab, you have to give them an Arabic Bible. Well, that's okay. But it's not a rule. What if this one wants an English Bible? Will God not speak to them through the English Bible? Because it's not their hard language? I was in Iraq one day, and one guy told me, come and help us translate the Bible into Badini language. I had done the Kurdish language in Sorani, and now this is another area of Iraq near Turkey. I said, sure, let's do it. So I collected a group of people, I interviewed different translators, hired them. We had about 12 people. We wanted to do a fast job. And I had a lot of experience in Bible translation. So I organized them, gave them their jobs to do, and so on. I left. Every two and a half months, I was coming back to supervise what they're doing, go over what they've done, and have reviewers, and so on. It's a big system. But the second trip I was there, the guy who asked me to do this translation work, and he funded the project, including my trips over there, he says, I can't wait for you to produce one gospel. Let's do it fast, because I want to witness to so many people, and, and I can't. I said, why can't you? He says, because they're Kurds. I need to give them the Bible in their language. If I give them the Sorani, they don't understand it about 50% different. I said, well, give them the Arabic Bible. He said, no, I won't give an Arabic Bible to a Kurd. They don't like the language. It's the language of their oppressors. I said, hello? What do they hear on the mosque? Allah, but what language was that? Oh, they hate it. I said, you think so? Let's do an experiment. So I brought the Gospel of Luke in the Sorani, but didn't tell them it was Sorani, because it has the same reading, Injil, Luca, same in the two languages. And then I brought a Gospel of Luke in Arabic. We have some of them back there. And I asked, he and I went to talk to a lot of people, said, which one would you rather read, in Bahdini or in Arabic? 100% of them chose the Arabic. 100%. 100%, all of them. You know why? Because they can speak Bahdini, but they weren't educated in it. They were educated in school in the Arabic language. So they chose Arabic. When I was young, I was given the Arabic in the Testament. Soon after, I discovered the King James Bible in English. And I began to read the English King Bible. And then I, Louis II in French, I started reading it in French. And my life was enriched by English and French. So don't be stuck on a concept, an idea. Give them a choice. And I often give them a choice. Yes, the other day I met a woman on the bus coming from the airport. I was, where was I last week? Kansas City, yes. And so I met her on the bus, and I shared the gospel with her. She turned out to be a Lebanese, and she had not heard the gospel before. And uh, then I connected. Actually, I just called her before, in the break to talk to her. I'm going to see her again tomorrow. She's visiting friends here in Boulder until Friday. And we took her to church on Sunday. Yeah. Right? Remember her? What's her name? Huh? Karen, Karen, a Lebanese woman. So I brought a full Bible and a New Testament. I said, which one would you like? She said, let me start with the New Testament. I gave her a choice. But the more literature, videos, and Bibles they get, the more likely they'll understand the Christian message.